Uh, let me welcome everybody to the Advanced uh, Diagnosis Recurring Support Group meeting for October, and in particular to welcome Dr. Shane Lloyd, uh, who will be presenting for the fireside chat, as we call it, for the first 20, 30 minutes or so of, uh, of our meeting. Uh, just quickly, let me review how it works, and then I'll turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Metzger, to, to introduce Dr. Lloyd. So this is how we run the meeting for those who perhaps are new to us. Um, our presenter, Dr. Lloyd, will present for 15 to 30 minutes. During and after the presentation, you may, uh, as a, participants, you may enter questions into the chat box on Zoom. I think at this stage, everybody is familiar with the chat box. Uh, after the presentation, so there's no interruptions to you then, Dr. Lloyd, after the presentation, we will look at the chat, and if there are any questions in there, we'll we'll conduct we will present them to you, and we may ask you to uh, to clarify if you ask some questions, folks. But please stay mute during the presentation, and in fact, during the Q and A, unless you're being asked a question, that just helps with with recording, with clarity of sound and everything. And then after the presentation, Dr. Lloyd, you are more than welcome to stay. But it will turn it over to uh, Ira and Dr. Metzger, and they will uh, converse with the with the men and others who may perhaps be on uh, with the with the, the monthly support group. So that's how we manage it. And now, Dr. Metzger, let me uh, turn it over to you uh, for a quick introduction to Dr. Lloyd, and I will go on mute. Okay. Is it? Yeah. There we go. Uh, our guest tonight is Dr. Shane Lloyd. Uh, he earned his MD degree at Penn State University College of Medicine. Yeah, he has a PhD in cellular and molecular biology to go with his uh, MD. Uh, he's trained in multiple advanced radiation oncology modalities, including SBRT, gamma knife, IMRT tomography, and brachytherapy. He has a special interest in treatment of the central nervous system breast and gastrointestinal tumors. And he's going to give us, uh, I hope, a little bit of an update on what's going on with the in the world of prostate and prostate radiation treatment. So uh, with let's turn it over to Dr. Uh, Lloyd. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Metzger, and uh, for the invitation to, to speak with you all. Uh, hello, and well, as I said, thank you very much for having me. I, I plan this to just be kind of an overview of uh, the, the roles for radiation therapy treatment in general for cases of advanced prostate cancer, um, metastatic prostate cancer, and recurrent prostate cancer. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very complicated world. There are many options. Um, I'm sure a lot of you gentlemen, uh, you know, you do research, you read things. So I don't want to pretend that this would be comprehensive of every treatment option available to you and Certainly, um, uh, I, I treat a lot of prostate and have for, for many years, but I, I also uh, wouldn't claim that I know every um, you, you know treatment option available. So I, I'm always um, curious in the, you know in the Q and A to to get an education from um, from you all as well. But we'll at least uh, uh, talk about uh, kind of some of the standard of care options and some of the interesting new data that's that's come out. Uh, uh, even in the last month or two um, related to metastatic disease. So um, this is probably well known by many, but prostate cancer is a very common cancer um, and uh, it really accounts for a large proportion of all cancer diagnosis uh, just in general. Um, most patients, you know, we're here talking about advanced prostate cancer, metastatic, et cetera. Most cases of prostate cancer that are diagnosed are, are localized, confined to the prostate. Um, but certainly um, a lot of patients may present initially not with it confined just to the prostate, but having spread to the lymph nodes or other parts of the body. Um, even in those cases though, overall, we see that the survival of prostate cancer is really quite tremendous owing to all of the advances we've seen in surgical techniques, radiation therapy, um, and all of the various sort of um, medicines that can be used uh, to treatment. So within five years of the diagnosis, um, you know, 99% of people are, are still alive. And um, uh, even if we look at 10 years and beyond, um, it's really impressive what um, uh, the advances we've made. 
Um, despite that, it, you know, it's a very common cancer, especially in men. Um, it is still a second leading cause of um, cancer-related death in men. So a lot of work to do, and um, we'll talk about some of the uh, ways radiation therapy is helping with that. Um, so what do we mean by um, you know, advanced prostate cancer? Well, typically at, at the time of diagnosis, we would think about that in terms of high-risk prostate cancer. In, in general, prostate cancer, when initially diagnosed, could can be classified into the low, intermediate, and high-risk groups, depending on various factors related to the pathology, the PSA level, et cetera. Um, generally, if we're thinking about advanced prostate cancer, it's going to be in that high-risk category, um, high PSA um, uh, spread perhaps to tissues uh, immediately adjacent to the prostate, into the seminal vesicles, which sit right next to the prostate, or to the lymph nodes nearby. Um, metastatic disease um, is spread not just locally around the prostate or in the pelvis, but to distant sites. And um, the most common sites where um, prostate cancer would spread would be um, primarily into the bones or into the lungs um, as a site. Um, just as a kind of an overview, one of the uh, very interesting developments I've seen over the course of my training starting you know, in medical school to residency and, and then into practice has been in the ways that we are able to, to stage patients. Um, years ago, we depended on things called bone scans and CT scans, and you know, those are still part of the, part of the guidelines. But uh, the imaging, the scans that we do and the tests that we do to define whether somebody is advanced or metastatic have really improved. And one of these has been the, the PSMA, um, which uh, uh, people who, who start to Google and research things about prostate will usually find this. The PSA is the prostate-specific membrane antigen. It is expressed by prostate cancer cells. And there is a type of PET scan that's been developed that is able to utilize this um, and uh, provide prostate-specific imaging, not just depending on does a lymph node look enlarged? Is there kind of a suspicious looking nodule in the lung? But uh, do we have, a, uh, we have a, a target that can actually light these up on a, uh, uh, um, on, a, on a PET scan and really allow us to see lesions that otherwise might have been thought to be benign or a lymph node that might have just looked normal, but it'll actually light up on a PSM, PSMA scan. So for patients with um, with high risk disease um, by traditional criteria, PSMA is a standard part of the workup. And we are able to find cases um, uh, of metastatic disease that we otherwise wouldn't have, wouldn't have known about. Um, again, the risk groups here we're talking about, you, know, you can go from very low, low to intermediate and high risk or very high. So in terms of the high or very high risk, these are gonna be patients who have um, disease that's uh, spread outside of the prostate, um, uh, it could be into the lymph nodes, having PSAs greater than uh, 20, um, and uh, the Gleason score being on the higher end, um, like an 8 or a 9, a 10, things of that nature. Um, the, the traditional treatment options for patients who have uh, what we call, I guess, advanced prostate or high or very high risk um, for patients who are expected to have a decent survival and want to pursue treatment, um, their options generally are going to be either radiation therapy or surgery. And uh, the sort of um, uh, chart you see here with the two splitting arrows, the top being uh, radiation therapy, EBRT stands for external beam radiation therapy, which um, is the type of radiation therapy you may be familiar with kind of coming in for your daily treatment over the course of several weeks. For the high or very high risk patients, the radiation therapy is combined with ADT, androgen deprivation therapy, over a period of 1.5 to 3 years. We'll kind of get into that. And then there are some other options in terms of combining external beam radiation with brachytherapy in addition to the androgen deprivation, um, or for very high-risk patients, combining traditional ADT, which is a drug that is uh, turning off your um, testosterone production, with an additional agent that can lower it even further than standard types of androgen deprivation. Um, 
Radical prostatectomy, RP, sort of in, in the lower arrow pointing down, also an option for high-risk patients. Um, uh, of course, I have, I have my bias here, uh, being a radiation oncologist, but um, the, the, the pause, of course, considering uh, surgery for high-risk disease is that there is an increased risk that either the cancer wouldn't be totally removed by the, by the surgery, or that it would come back, the, the prostate cancer could have a recurrence after the surgery, resulting in the need to have radiation therapy after surgery. Um, and in that scenario, one has sort of thought themselves side effect from surgery or radiation therapy. So um, it's always important for any patient diagnosed with prostate cancer of any stage to have a, have a thorough consultation with a urologist, a surgeon, and a radiation oncologist and um, discuss the, um, the pros and cons, the risks of um, the various treatment approach. Some patients very appropriate for radiation therapy and hormone therapy. Others, surgery could be the right option, but it's important to hear um, your, be fully informed on the treatment options available. Um, in terms of uh, the androgen deprivation therapy, that is the uh, testosterone deprivation, um, testosterone is uh, sort of a stimulus for prostate cancer. It's a growth factor, and this ADT androgen deprivation uh, is, is the use of drugs that um, uh, lower the, the testosterone levels. Generally, for our advanced patients, this is going to be for a period of 1.5 to 3 years, typically starting a couple of months before radiation therapy. There's sort of the most of the clinical trials that have explored this have uh, had this running period before starting um, uh, the radiation therapy. Um, and as I mentioned, for those in the very high risk patients, patients who have disease spread into the seminal vesicles, have very high testosterone or very high Gleason scores, um, the traditional um, um, uh, androgen deprivation therapy, um, things like uh, Lupron, et cetera, um, can be combined with other agents like abiraterone, which can decrease the testosterone level to really near zero and, and has shown um, benefit for these uh, very high-risk patients. The duration of the hormone therapy, there's a lot of con uh, um, controversy about how long high-risk or advanced patients need the hormone therapy for. There have been trials here like this one in, from 2018 that compared 18 to 36 months didn't see any difference in overall survival. Um, better BCR, biochemical uh, control rates with longer, not too surprising, but is just the PSA on paper the most important thing? Um, typically for my patients, uh, I don't prescribe the hormone therapy myself, but when you're working with the urologist or medical oncologist, we're typically aiming for at least a year and a half um, and then there can be discussions after that on, on pros and cons of continuing it beyond that. But um, the, the bottom line is for most, um, you know, advanced, um, uh, high risk, very high risk patients, uh, at least a year and a half or 18 months of the testosterone deprivation um, uh, has been shown to uh, result in significant improvement in survival and, and reduced um, uh, metastatic disease. In terms of radiation therapy for these advanced patients, typically the targets of radiation in these cases are gonna be the prostate itself, the seminal vesicles, and then the lymph nodes uh, that uh, are in the pelvis itself. If uh, one had uh, imaging such as that PSMA test that I mentioned that showed uh, an active involved lymph node, then typically the radiation oncologist would design the treatment such that that involved lymph node got what we call boosted during the treatment, that is uh, treated to a higher dose. So the prostate gets treated to a high dose, the, um, the lymph nodes that um, are apparently normal looking are treated to a lower sort of prophylactic dose to treat any potential microscopic cells, and then any um, truly involved lymph nodes would get boosted up to a higher dose. Um, most patients uh, can be treated over the course of five weeks. You know, 10 years ago, most prostate cancer patients were being treated over eight to nine weeks. Uh, this is rarely needed anymore. Um, lots of studies have come out um, looking at five-week regimens of radiation therapy and compared them to longer eight or nine-week courses. And really, the standard of care for 
almost all patients these days would be the, the, these um, would be a uh, would be a five week course. We call that moderate hypofractionation, which is a kind of a fancy term, but um, uh, just to say that unless somebody has say really bad baseline urine function and we kind of want to do a very gentle treatment, five weeks of treatment for the the prostate and the pelvic lymph nodes would be very standard for a for a high or very high risk patients. Um, some folks know or have read about uh, SBRT, stereotactic body radiation therapy. This is very short, um, five treatment option, not five weeks, but five days. Um, really now considered fairly standard for the intermediate or low risk patients. Um, still would be considered sort of um, uh, outside of the standard of care for high risk patients. Just at this point, not as much data, not as much long-term follow-up to say that that is a, um, a safe option for these patients. Things change all the time. In five, 10 years, you could give the same talk and I could talk about the big study that was published doing SBRT for high-risk patients and the wonderful outcomes they got. So um, that uh, I hope will uh, change with time because I'd love to get my patients done in five days rather than even five weeks. Um, but right now, um, something closer to five weeks would be um, pretty standard. Uh, prostate radiation has evolved over time. Um, you know, on, on the far left here, something called 3D conformal radiation. It's essentially just four beams coming in, two from the front, two from the back, and we treated everything like it was shaped like a cube. Um, and this is how folks got around for a lot of time. We had an evolution to something called intensity modulated radiation therapy, IMRT, in the 1990s. Um, uh, this allowed for some shaping uh, of the radiation field, some sparing of the bladder and the rectum, et cetera. And then now, um, uh, standardly, patients are treated with something called VMAT, um, volumetric uh, arc therapy. Essentially, it just means many different beams coming from all different angles in order to really shape the radiation, it allows us to keep really tight margins, um, which means less normal tissue getting radiation dose, less side effects in the short term and the long term, okay? Um, protons are controversial uh, for, for prostate cancer. Um, uh, I say this is a place that doesn't have protons, but most proton therapy um, is really, um, you know, when we compare it to older types of radiation, 3D conformal, even a lot of types of IMRT, definite advantage. Um, you know, I could have a whole hour just about the physics of protons. With modern radiation therapy, with VMAT, um, with SBRT, um, uh, we're really not seeing any, uh, uh, you know, advantage of protons anymore for, for prostate cancer. Um, Although, um, you know, folks interested in that uh, should go to a consultation uh, with a center that does um, proton therapy and, and they could talk about it in more detail. Um, so at Hope, we have um, something called tomotherapy, which is a, a, a essentially a type of VNAT that allows us to deliver very very precise, very conformal radiation therapy to patients. Uh, this is similar to what the machine would look like. You can also deliver SBRT and other techniques. Um, SBRT, as I mentioned, the uh, acronym, stereotactic body radiation therapy, essentially it just refers to very precise high dose perfraction radiation. It doesn't have to be just the prostate, it could be really anywhere in the body. Um, it could be SBRT in the brain uh, is also done. Um, but in the lung, um, in the abdomen, anywhere. And, and as I mentioned, typically when we're treating just the prostate, reserved for low or intermediate risk disease, high risk for extenuating circumstances at this time. I, I, I have done it a few times, um, but um, uh, typically uh, would be one of these longer courses. Can also be used to treat um, uh, other sites in the pelvis, lymph nodes, et cetera, and, and I'll talk about that um, you know, shortly. Okay, so sort of just uh, transitioning a little bit from that idea of treating other sites in the pelvis to the recurrent setting. So um, uh, I guess before I go on, um, if uh, I'll just pause for a moment if there are any questions at this point, or um, uh, I'll just kind of power through or we could 
talk about them at the end. Yeah, Dr. Lloyd, would you uh, comment now or maybe at the end about the view ray situation? Yeah, yeah. So um, why don't I talk a little bit more about SBRT and then I will comment on the uh, the very bizarre situation with this thing called view ray. Um, so yes, that's a good that's a good point. Um, so um, I I think. What defines uh, what defines a recurrence for for patients? Um, generally, we look at the PSA. Um, so essentially, um, after surgery, one PSA should go down to zero. Um, if it doesn't, that suggests that there's some residual cancer. So if somebody has a, a surgery and their PSA goes to zero, and then three, six, a year later, it starts to creep up, we're concerned about a recurrence. By definition, if it goes above 0 0.2, that would be considered a recurrence. After radiation therapy, say somebody's PSA is at a 10 before treatment, it goes down to a 0 0.4, okay? That low point, that 0 0.4 would be called their nadir. Now, if six months, a year, five years later, the PSA starts creeping up 2.0 above that nadir, that would meet the definition for, um, for a recurrence. Um, so there's there's different criteria sort of for whether somebody had a prior prostatectomy or if they had prior radiation therapy. But at that point, um, uh, well, what comes next? We, we got this PSA, but wh where is it coming from? So workup after a PSA failure could include traditional imaging like CT scans, bone scans, MRIs of the pelvis, the PSMA that I uh, mentioned earlier sort of looking for what is the source of the, um, the PSA that's come back. The PSA is really, PSMA has really helped us with that um, because it is able to identify maybe isolated lymph nodes or bone lesions that are the source of the PSA or an actual occurrence within the prostate itself. Maybe the radiation therapy just wasn't able to kill every last cell and there's some um, regrowth. We may biopsy that site and then talk about, well, what comes next in terms of treatment. Recurrence in the prostate could involve everything from brachytherapy, which is a type of internal radiation therapy treatment uh, involving, say, radioactive seeds or a temporary implant. It inc could include this SBRT surgery. Typically not. Urologists tend to not to like to uh, operate on... Uh, um, prostates that have received prior radiation therapy. Um, the, the tissues are sort of scarred down around. It can make it difficult to remove. But there are other options that um, urologists could offer in terms of high-frequency ultra ultrasound ablation or cryoablation or going on to, to hormone therapy. In terms of um, recurrence within the lymph nodes itself, so say somebody has a recurrence, they had prior prostate-only radiation therapy, PSA has come back, meets the criteria for a recurrence. They get a PSMA scan. It shows a single involved lymph node. Well, what do we do? Well, do we treat all of the lymph nodes and just boost the one that in, that's involved? Or do we just, you know, focally treat the, um, treat the uh, lymph node that shows up on the scan? There's really no right or wrong answer. And that's certainly a, a long conversation to be had um, that I've had with many patients. The most comprehensive treatment would be to treat all of the lymph nodes like you like you might up front and boost the ones that show up on the scan. That probably has the um, most, obviously the most time commitment, five weeks of treatment, um, most potential for side effects, but probably the highest chance of controlling things and not having it come back again. The more convenient, you know, sort of easier Focal treatment would be to do SBRT, just focally treat the, the lymph node that was involved. Um, you can get into a little bit of a whack-a-mole situation, though, where, you know, six months, a year later, PSA comes back up again, another lymph node is involved, and then you need to have another conversation about that. Um, I guess before I'll go on, I'll, I'll sort of address, since um, SBRT, this focal radiation therapy is, uh, issue has been coming up a lot at, at, at Hoag. We um, have a machine called the ViewRay that uses MRI guidance to deliver radiation therapy. And this is a, uh, a machine that we got about three years ago. Um, and it's uh, really been very nice to treat patients with it. Allows us to have high 
um, quality, very detailed images of the prostate or of a lymph node or of a bone met, uh, anything that we're treating um, and, and uh, do really nice treatments with it. Unfortunately, the company that owns, operates and services the V-Ray machine apparently was very poorly managed. And uh, back this past summer, they declared bankruptcy. And over the last few months, they were unable to find someone to acquire their company and the massive amount of debt they have acquired. So today was actually um, the last day that our site and sites all over the world uh, technically were able to treat patients with ViewRay. Um, they're sort of now going into chapter seven and it's unclear who's gonna take over the um, intellectual property servicing of it. We're working on some options to be able to continue to use the machine because we think it's a wonderful tool, um, but it's all very much up in the air uh, right now. So um, we've actually been in touch daily with the other sites that have UA machines um, uh, at UCLA and around the country um, and around the world, actually. There's a lot of them in Europe and uh, we've all been um, sort of trying to figure out what the next steps will be. So. V-Ray is a wonderful technology um, that was created and uh, serviced by um, a company with um, that made some apparently very poor business decisions and now we're having to deal with it. That being said, um, while it was a great tool, it certainly um, allowed us to do great treatments. 95% um, of centers never had a V-Ray. And all of the clinical trials, you know, for SBRT, for all these treatments I've been talking about, you know, never used a view ray. And we still have the ability to offer, um, you know, wonderful SBRT focal radiation treatments with our other equipment. Um, so uh, we're very hopeful that things will work out with the view ray. But even if, even if not, we will continue on and still be able to offer, um, you know, fantastic uh, treatment to our patients. Um, in terms of uh, metastatic recurrence, so I talked in the previous slides about lymph node recurrence, and do we treat all the lymph nodes or just a single lymph node? Well, what if we're not talking about um, lymph nodes, what we're talking about um, other sites? I mentioned the lung and, and the bones as, as sites that uh, prostate cancer likes to spread. So there's a concept that's developed you know, over the last 10 plus years, something called oligometastatic disease, oligo meaning sort of few. So um, there are various definitions for it, but generally five or less. What if there's only a, a limited amount of sites that show up on a scan uh, where the cancer is spread? Maybe somebody has just a single bone met in their femur or uh, a lesion in a rib and one in the lung. Well, is that different than if it's very widely metastatic? And there was actually two very interesting trials published within the last um, five years or so. One was called the Stampede trial, and that compared giving patients who were um, metastatic uh, with uh, limited metastatic disease, uh, androgen deprivation, that testosterone deprivation alone, or testosterone deprivation plus radiation to the prostate itself. This was an interesting question. So it, it's already spread to other parts of the body, but should we still treat the prostate? You know, if you had initial diagnosis that was already metastatic. And they actually found that treating the prostate, even though it's already spread to other places, actually improved uh, survival. At three years, 81% of men were still alive versus 73% just getting hormone therapy. So now for patients, uh, you know, who have a new diagnosis, of metastatic disease with a limited number of sites will offer radiation therapy to the prostate itself, even though there's already been spread. Uh, the second question would be, well, okay, we should, there is a benefit to treating the prostate itself. Should we treat those, um, those sites where it's actually spread? And there was a study that came out um, uh, a few years ago called the Saber Comet trial, and they compared just doing palliative radiation, the kind of gentle radiation therapy that we've been doing for many decades to, to, to metastatic lesions, comparing that to more aggressive dosing using this SBRT high dose per fraction. And they actually found that um, 
patients live longer, they had improved survival by quite a bit by treating the bone lesions. And so, especially for prostate cancer patients that were well represented in this trial, if somebody has limited number of metastatic lesions, we will um, typically offer SBRT to treat those sites, also treat the prostate. And then of course, their urologist or medical oncologist would typically have them uh, on um, androgen deprivation therapy uh, as well. Uh, doctor? Yes. I have a question. Um, at the top of this slide, you have limited number of metastatic lesions. Uh, um, would those lesions be detected by bone scan or PSMA scan? Uh, when this study was conducted, uh, this the, the, the studies that I'm referring to, they did not use the PSMA scan. It would be a combination of CT scans or bone scans. So this is also complicated things because what if somebody, there are situations where we have a patient who have a normal CT, normal bone scan, um, but then we get a PSMA scan and it shows a metastasis in the bone. The, before that technology existed, we wouldn't even have known that they're metastatic. How does that fit into all this paradigm? That uh, incorporating these more advanced imaging into these type of trials is still forthcoming, but to answer your question, for these trials, it was with more traditional imaging that um, they were found. Mm -hmm. um, that's my case. Um, I've discussed this with uh, my nephew, who is a urologist. And um, uh, so I have uh, 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 a five uh, met METs, as they're called, uh, but detected with PSMA scan. And he said to me, if I had a bone scan, we would never know how many would have shown up in a in a bone scan. Mm. So th that I guess is um, is still being worked through by the um, by 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 the the specialists uh, because the PSMA is relatively new. Is that right? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's been around for a while. For for yeah. um, I mean, I think at least for 10 years in development. But yeah, new to the scene relatively for prostate cancer is kind of a standard of care and being covered by Medicare and, and insure private insurances, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, typically, I think you'd probably find most radiation oncologists would, would give the patient the benefit of the doubt. And even if they had a negative CT and bone scan, but they showed up on the PSMA, I would still treat them like this trial. And you know, as long as the patient was you know, after a discussion of risks and benefits, um, uh, was thought it was reasonable um, that I, I would treat a um, uh, limited number of bone sites or um, metastases in general with um, with SBRT according mm -hmm. to this trial. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, another issue that comes up, well, what about if there's more than five? And this is actually data that just came out here within the last uh, month or so. Um, they looked at patients specifically with more than five um, metastases. And um, they, they, they specifically mentioned, we excluded people with, um, with five or less because we didn't want to interfere with their enrollment on other clinical trials like the ones I'd mentioned. So these are patients who have um, more than five um, metastatic lesions. And they said, well, what if we, even if they had no symptoms, these, these could have just been found on a scan. Uh, a lot of time bone uh, metastases are painful, but if they were in a high risk location, a load bearing location like the spine um, or, the, or the hip, the femur, a long bone, a shoulder joint, what if we just treated those? Would that result in some improvement? So these patients were typically not treated with SBRT, although some of them were. They were typically treated with more of the, the gentler dosing type of um, uh, uh, treatments that we do, but they were treated all the sites. And they actually found in, in this um, very exciting data that treatment of those sites in load-bearing high-risk location reduced the number of fractures, what they called skeletal events. So reduced the rate that the bones broke hospitalizations. Obviously, if, if one breaks their hip, there's going to be a big hospitalization and all these other issues and actually improve their survival. It's not clear, you know, what, what's likely going on is if somebody, you know, has a serious bone fracture in their femur, you know, the long bone of their, of their thigh, 
or in their hip, it becomes deb uh, debilitating. They're going into the hospital. You know, they're less immobile. They're more immobilized. They get weaker. Now you can develop, you know, lung issues, all these sorts of things. So there, there appears to be a, a big advantage to keeping patients from having fractures, keeping them out of the hospital, and they could live longer. This study was not specific to prostate cancer patients, but again, prostate cancer are very common, and so was represented in the study. Um, and this has actually changed our practice patterns here. Even over the last month, I had um, you know, medical oncologists contacting me. I just saw this paper in the journal Clinical Oncology. Um, we should probably be treating you know, patients even if they're asymptomatic and, and try to improve things. So um, something to consider um, even for patients who are widely metastatic, um, that um, treatment of um, their, their bone metastatic lesions in high risk areas um, can result in less fractures, less hospitalization than improved survival. Um, sometimes I'll say patients will ask, well, and this is just is a broad for, for all cases, what about just doing hormone therapy alone? Generally, we just consider that for patients who have limited life expectancy. If someone's expected for other health reasons, maybe they have heart condition, you know, COPD, uh, emphysema, heart failure, and they're just not expected to live, you know, you know they're going to live less than five years. Then we say, well, maybe we just put them on the hormone therapy alone. That'll keep things at bay for long enough um, that something else will, will get them. So uh, hormone therapy alone is not curative, but it can control prostate cancer for many years. And it can be a, a very good option for, um, for older patients, frail patients, or those who have other health problems. Keep the prostate cancer at bay, um, and you don't have to undergo you know, any radiation therapy, uh, any surgery, anything like that. Um, kind of really just focus on quality of life. Um, but if, if patients are otherwise healthy, expected to live longer than five years, um, there, there typically is a role for um, radiation therapy as part of their treatment, whether they're advanced, recurrent, or metastatic. Okay, this is just a summary here. It's kind of things we talked about. Um, locally advanced, that's the high or very high risk patients typically treated with radiation plus hormone therapy, maybe one of these other medicines like abiraterone, recurrent disease, typically going to get some sort of radiation therapy, plus or minus hormone therapy. Metastatic disease could be treated with this focal high dose per treatment radiation called SBRT if there's a limited number of sites. If um, someone has many sites and they're in high risk locations, radiation therapy can help prevent fractures, keep them out of the hospital. And for patients with limited life expectancy, ADT alone, um, uh, typically, sometimes with radiation, can be offered. Okay, and I think that was it in terms of my presentation. Now, thank you, Dr. Uh, Lloyd. That was very, very good as a surgeon to a radiation guy. That was really well done. Um, Thank you. Hope, hope that doesn't offend you. Uh, I have a, a question or just a reminder for you and everyone else listening that Dr. Spratt is going to talk to us Thursday night about AI and its use in radiation, its use in androgen deprivation, and where, where does it fit in urology in general. So, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to keep up on, on some of these things that are um, in, in the news lately. And then do you think that PSMA is going to ever be a, a direct a way to direct SBRT to a, a lesion? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and we actually do do we use that now. So um, so typically when somebody's gonna um so same as somebody has a PSMA scan and it, and it finds a lesion, when somebody comes in for their radiation therapy, we obtain a non-contrast CT scan uh, of the area we're gonna treat, and then in the computer we will actually fuse their PSMA scan with their planning scan. And in three dimensions, we can localize the same spot on the PSMA scan to their anatomy on their treatment planning scan and design the radiation uh, around that. So yeah, PSMA is very helpful. Those type of um, PET scans for helping us localize where we need to direct the radiation. Um, and I think that's probably been the one of the biggest advances you know, in prostate um, imaging and diagnosis and treatment over the last 
five or 10 years is the, is the PSMA. It's just been a, a really great tool. Yes, it has. I think it's probably the best one since I, I retired 10 years ago, but uh, I, I think it's one of the biggest advances we've ever had. Uh, it's too bad some of the old studies were done with bone scans and other scans because they may not have been as accurate as, as perhaps this new stuff is. Um, anyways, uh, do we have any questions in the chat, uh, Brian? Yes, there is simply one question asking for a clarification. Will the view ray not be in use until there is a resolution of their financial problems? Yeah, so the main issue is that, um, so FDA, FDA clearance mm -hmm. for operation and use of a medical device on a patient, part of that FDA clearance is dependent on there being a qualified um, agency or individual that can um, monitor and service the machine. And so we are now in talks with Hogue and other sites around the world are looking at either hiring a third party to potentially come in and offer that monitoring and service or hiring as a contractor, one of the former view ray engineers to come and be our own personal sort of mm -hmm. engineer for them. That is all very much in flux. And we're also waiting to hear what happens with the court proceedings. Um, you know, we get on these meetings, everybody agrees, view ray, the MRI guided view ray technology, fantastic. It's just really unfortunate um, uh, how they operated their company and, and the position that put it in. So, um, so yeah, patient treatments in the United States are all pausing after today until we get more clarification and the sites get clarification about who's gonna service it and we get some more feedback from the FDA about um, all these sorts of things. Thank you. There are no other questions in the chat. Yeah. Doctor, did you have anything else? Well, we have one one hand raised here. Oh, uh, go ahead, Bob. Yes, uh, one more question, Doctor. Um, <clears throat> I was do diagnosed about ten months ago. And um, it took me <clears throat> it took me about two months for my insurance to approve the PSMA scan. And I was told um, <clears throat> it was rather new and it was expensive. And I'm wondering, um, in the last 10 months or the year, um, is, is it becoming more common? Are they making more machines? And are there more people who can operate them accurately? And has the uh, the cost factor of that changed uh, recently? Uh, for uh, this was for the the PSMA test or yes, PS, okay. PSMA scan. I, I I believe so. These things are certainly in flux. My my understanding is the ins private insurers sort of follow what Medicare will cover. It's my understanding. Uh, the last I heard about it was that. The coverage at this current point was just for high risk patients. But I'm not sure the, the status of, of your diagnosis in that, but, but currently I believe Medicare and most private insurers are only covering for the high risk patients. Obviously we'd like to get that maybe into the, what we call the unfavorable intermediate risk. But if you were in one of these lower risk categories, um, the mo most of the data and studies on PSMA have been in these, these higher risk or recurrent patients. So I don't think they'll be eager to um, start paying for a more expensive test until more data comes out about its possible utility in patients who have lower risk. That being said, you know the risk of having um, spread outside of the prostate goes down significantly if you're in the low or intermediate risk category. So probably not as much benefit to doing the PSMA in general if you're not in that high risk category, but um, you know, I think eventually, you know, as the technology matures and goes on and gets cheaper, um, it'll just be part of the standard sort of thing we get for for all patients. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I was in the high risk. Um, okay. And, yeah. Uh, it it took two months. I was very frustrated. Newly diagnosed. Um, I switched insurance plans. Um, there's a story to that, but uh, I'm wondering, are they making more machines? Are, are they going to be more prevalent, uh, perhaps, and uh, less expensive? Yeah, it's it's not so much about the machine. The machine that does the imaging is the same as 
you know, other types of PET scans that we do, like for lung cancer, breast cancer, et cetera, it's really the special agent that binds the, the essentially the tracker to the PSMA that's very expensive to manufacture. Um, and, and so, you know, various companies and different agents are coming online. And I think as their production ramps up and, you, you know, um, eventually if we get some generics, things like that, the cost will come down significantly, but it's mostly the, the tracer that is the expensive part, not so much the, the machine as you can you can um, do the imaging on uh, any type of pet machine. Oh, right. I, I recall that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you, doctor, very much. Appreciate your, your time, your expertise. Thank and you Dr. So much for having really me. Final word to you and Dr. Lloyd. Yes. Thank you very much. That was very well done. Appreciate it.